Hey everybody, welcome into Cover 4 Live, presented by Georgia Farm Bureau. My name is Brandon Adams. A little bit different version of our program here this week. We are pre-recording our show as the Georgia Bulldogs are in an off week, but we will still continue to bring you plenty of hot topics related to the Georgia program over the course of the next couple of minutes. Happy to have Mike Griffith, Jeff Sintel, Connor Riley involved in all of those discussions right now. And let's be honest, there's been a little bit of a, of a negative vibe, which is to be expected after a loss to a team like Alabama, which Georgia fans are hungry to finally get their first victory against. And maybe at some point in time that will come. But for now, you're left to pick up the pieces. So I thought we would try to maybe take an optimistic spin on kind of what's to come over the season second half, maybe even picking a player in particular that you're looking forward to seeing more from. So, Mike, with that in mind, you know, Georgia next Saturday will start a run of six consecutive games against SEC opponents to close out the season. Which Georgia player do you think it's going to be fun for fans to watch over the course of that span? I'm going to say Kendall Milton. I, I mean, we, we're, we'll get to quarterbacks. I don't know if it's fun right now. That seems like a headache more than anything. But, but I think Kendall Milton, without a doubt, is a guy that's going to get more work, that's going to continue to come on. I mean, look, B.A., the first time I, I really had my eyes open was that Auburn game. And some 285, 290-pound guy bounced off Kendall like he was wearing Kevlar. And, and then the Tennessee game, I counted. I had to do the, the replay three or four times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, nine guys, Tennessee guys hit him before 22 goes down. I'm sold on Kendall Milton. I think he's a, a rising star who's going to have a tremendous finish to the season. Jeff, in some respects, the Milton play in the Tennessee game where he shook off the defenders, in a weird way, that's one of the most exciting plays of the season. Even though it came at a time in which the game was already decided, you know, the, the, the sheer power that Milton showed off on that play, it's easy to understand why people want to see more of him after something like that. Yeah, guys, it's kind of like what we kept saying when he was a recruit. Now, we didn't know if he would be as fast as Todd Gurley, but we knew he would be dang gum hard, very hard to get on the ground, hard to tackle, bruiser with that four or five speed, and that's what he's been so far for Georgia. You know, the encouraging thing is you've seen more of him early in games. You've seen more of him back in the gun with Stetson Bennett, which shows that the staff has confidence in him as a pass protector, which is probably the main thing that keeps a young back off the player chart, at least in those early key important reps. Since Mike took Milton off the board, though, um, I guess I got to go for something that um, it's got to help Georgia and it's got to evolve Georgia because really we, we never really thought Georgia had the maturity on offense to score and go into Tuscaloosa and beat Alabama. So what I'm looking for are, is the evolution and maybe guys just getting a little bit better. I think Jermaine Burton is really coming into that. But to just give a different name, I think we've got to see more of Darnell Washington. We've got to see more of Marcus Rosamy Jackson. I think those two guys um, are the guys that I think has got to give a lot more potency to the Georgia offense. Connor, how about for you? I'll go defense here. I, I know we now know that defense can't win you big games, especially against Alabama and, and the likes of that. But I'm excited to see what Nicobe Dean continues to do. I, I think you saw on Saturday he had that one sack in the second half there. He's, I think, only going to continue to get better there. And, again, the, the thing with Nicobe is always going to be how he stacks up to Roquan because that's sort of the comparison that's easy to make there. And at times on Saturday, I think you started to see some shades of him there that playmaking sideline to sideline ability. What Roquan did really well in 2017 as well was as a blitzer. I believe he led Georgia in sacks that year. So th those sorts of elements, as he continues to get more comfortable and develop more as a player, th those steps that he takes, you know, he's now been four games in as a starter for this Georgia defense. I think as this season progresses, and there are a lot of guys on Georgia who I think can be potential difference makers, but N'Kobe Dean is a guy that really sticks out to me as a guy who can really continue to get better with the more reps he takes with this Georgia defense. So I'm going to take Jermaine Burton here. I know it wasn't a perfect day for Burton on Saturday. He maybe had a couple of balls he could have caught. And, you know, he's obviously a work in progress, like so many people on this Georgia offense are. But this is a guy that was getting open against Alabama. Now, the Alabama pass defense hasn't been impossible to get open against thus far this season. But it's not all that long in the in the – you know, the two distant past that Georgia's had a hard time seeing receivers capable of doing that. But I think the Georgia receiving core right now is is better than it was a year ago. Obviously, George Pickens is still a part of that. Kiaris Jackson had been a revelation through the first three games of the season, and Burton was getting open on Saturday. 
I'm actually, Mike, fairly optimistic about what Georgia has at the receiver spot this year so far. I think over the course of the second half, it could be a big story. As I said before, I think on the aggregate, that group is, is playing better than it was last season. Yeah, just depends on who's on the trigger and how the defense is playing them. You know, Kyrus really uh, flourished early. Stetson was finding them, but we saw Alabama bracket Stetson, or excuse me, saw them bracket Kyrus Jackson, and, and Georgia really didn't have the answer. Yeah, they threw it 11 times to Jermaine, but he only caught four of them, and one went off his hands for a pick, and he dropped a touchdown. I think they'll continue to go with him. They obviously like him. I think he'll get better and better as he gets used to the college game. But, you know, if, if there if or when there is a quarterback change and you get a, a, a JT Daniels back there, somebody with a stronger arm, I think you'll see more targets for George Pickens on the perimeter deeper. That's the kind of receiver that George is. I think if Matt Landers gets back healthy, I know that he had a really good chemistry going in the offseason uh, with Daniels. Uh, and I want to see more Trey McKitty. You know, you mentioned Darnell Washington, but I was really shocked they only went once to Trey McKitty after he was so successful against Tennessee, especially as vulnerable as Alabama had been against the Ole Miss and Texas A&M tight ends. Jeff, if I gave you another name on defense, or if I ask you for another name on defense, Connor gave me one. You know, I, I do think that when, when you see the way in which explosive offense won the day again on Saturday, I guess it makes me, you know, a little more interested in what Georgia itself is going to do offensively. But, but who else do you want to see more of defensively? It's not a good day at the Georgia secondary, but the truth is, is you can't upgrade the talent. That's about the best collection of, you know, talent and the defense the secondary anywhere in the country. What do you want to see more of from Georgia defensively to make games like the one played Saturday more winnable? Yeah, I think you need to see a little bit more playmaking ability and a little bit more bruiser, Greg Blue, Thomas Davis type striking ability out of Lewis scene. Remember folks, there's going to be roughly seven guys out of that Georgia defensive back room that's going to be gone after this year. So Lewis seems got to step into a playmaker, big difference maker type role. When we think about, honestly, Brandon, the name that comes to my mind is kind of an obvious one for both sides of the ball, um, which is what we maybe haven't seen so far in 2020. And that is Trayvon Walker and George Pickens looking like the dudes we thought they were going to be. You know, we know who we thought, we knew who they thought they were. That's what I think we need to see out of both of those guys for the rest of 2020. Those guys playing like the difference makers they need to be for Georgia. I hadn't really thought about that, but it is fair to say that Walker has been somewhat quiet thus far this season. Let me just kind of, before we wrap this topic up, let, let me just kind of mention something here. You know, Mike talked about this with Karis Jackson, obviously think about the Alabama playmakers on Saturday. I mean, the one thing that I do think is true is that coaching mattered against Alabama. I, I think the way in which Jax was put in handcuffs, I think you've got to give the Alabama coaching staff credit for that, Connor. And the way in which Alabama is scheming up all of these plays. And listen, I'm not smart enough to even know how it was they're doing it. But it's always one of the better Alabama receivers running with a Georgia defensive back chasing him. I think you have to give Steve Sarkeesian credit for that. You know, this was a day in which I thought the Alabama coaching staff had a good day. Smart started his post-game press conference on Saturday saying that we were out coached. Typically, that's just kind of an empty platitude that coaches throw out there. But on Saturday, it does seem like the Alabama coaches got the better of their counterparts on the other sideline. Yeah, I, I think Steve Sarkeesian had a better day than Dan Landing and Kirby Smart certainly did. And then you look at what Alabama did defensively, as Mike brought up with Kiaris Jackson. Th that's an old Bill Belichick thing where they're going to take away the thing you want to do the most. And, and for that Georgia passing offense for the first couple of games, it was Kiaris Jackson. And Georgia sort of not having him as that go-to guy on third down that security blanket I think over the course of the game that's why you sort of saw Stetson Bennett struggle the way he did and going forward teams are going to try to replicate that last year I think you saw when South Carolina came out and really gummed up the Georgia offense everyone else out there had that blueprint and they sort of knew what to do from there and the coaching staff couldn't make the adjustments needed will be I'll be interested to see out of this bye week what sort of adjustments Todd Munkin makes with this offense as a way to get more out of it because I think Alabama showed more than anything else Georgia needs to be a better offensive team if they are going to get to where they want to go. It's Cover 4 Live presented by Georgia Farm Bureau. I'm Brandon Adams. You just heard from Connor Riley, Mike Griffith, Jeff Sintel on hand as well. All presented by our friends at Georgia Farm Bureau. And the one thing that you know if you've been watching this show on a regular basis is that Georgia Farm Bureau is here for Georgia's farmers and a big believer and a supporter, cheerleader for Georgia's agricultural community. And as we head towards the election time of year, that's even more important as, as well. There are a lot of issues 
on the ballot, candidates on the ballot that are important for Georgia's farmers. And one of the things that Georgia Farm Bureau believes is giving those farmers a voice in the election process is a very important thing. That's why they've started the I Farm, I Vote campaign. If you go to the website, ifarmivoteGA.com, that's ifarmivoteGA.com, you can learn more about the issues that are important to Georgia's agricultural community. You can hear interviews with candidates and have issues explained. And it's really a great resource to find out both ways in which Georgia Farm Bureau supports Georgia's farmers, but also a way for Georgia farmers to kind of find out what's on the ballot and what's at stake for them here this November. It's ifarmivoteGA.com. Check that out as Georgia Farm Bureau continues to support Georgia's farmers. All right, so let's move to the topic at hand, or at least the hottest topic for fans over the last few days. Kirby Smart has not exactly poured gasoline on this fire too much with his comments this week, but certainly fans are wondering where Georgia stands at quarterback after the loss to Alabama on Saturday, which clearly quarterback play factored into three interceptions for Stetson Bennett. That's too many against a team like Alabama. And yet the mystery of what might happen if Stetson Bennett were not to be Georgia's quarterback anymore, I think is just as intense as ever because there is still a lot about the presumed next guy in line, JT Daniels, that we just don't know a lot about. So Jeff, let me begin with you on this. If no other reason that I've heard from Mike Griffith and Connor Riley on this topic on dog nation daily this week, open ended question, and you can start us off and we'll just take it where it goes. What do you think is currently going on with Georgia's quarterback situation in terms of Bennett as the starter and whoever is uh, behind him potentially waiting in the wings? Where do you think things stand right now? I guess I would cross two bridges with this thought here, Brandon. One, I don't think Stetson Bennett has done anything outside of that third quarter against mighty Alabama to lose the job. Uh, but perhaps the main main bread and butter here I'm going to stick to is I just don't think JT Daniels is healthy. That's the knee. Um, we all know about the second surgery where the timeline is basically not last August to this August. I just don't think JT Daniels is ready to come in and really give Georgia something different in the pocket than what they're currently getting right now with Stetson Bennett. I think Stetson Bennett probably freelances a little bit too much. Uh, for Kirby Smart and the staff's liking, but I think that's one of his greatest strengths. I don't even know if the competition is happening here. Um, and the other takeaway is this. This is an all SEC schedule. Normally you would have gotten a half against uh, Louisiana Tech or Middle Tennessee State or somebody like that um, to get Dwan Mathis comfortable or maybe to see a little bit of a guy like Carson Beck, a guy that we heard a lot of great things coming out of those fall scrimmages that, scrimmages that were supposed to be so important. Main thing, I think, is just the healthier of JT Daniels and a level of confidence in Stetson Bennett to win most of these games. Mike, how would you respond to what Jeff just said there? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think it's all about the health of JT Daniels. I think it's all about how well he's moving. You know, on the Wednesday teleconference, Kirby Smart said he's moving better. He's getting a lot of reps. I mean, that would indicate that, you know, they want to try him out. They want to see what he's got. Uh, Dwan and, and Carson Beck also getting reps. So, uh, but but Kirby also said that the big takeaway was that those players around Stetson Bennett have to do better. So he didn't necessarily indicate there was going to be a change. Uh, he didn't rule out there was going to be a change. I, I just I think it's a fluid situation. And uh, I think when JT Daniels is healthy enough, he'll be the guy. Connor, what do you think? Yeah, I I, I think Mike, Mike and Jeff have sort of hit the nail on the head. JT Daniels is not the JT Daniels that was the five star freshman that ended his season, his freshman year, with a, with a pretty good performance against a very good Notre Dame team. This is a guy who's still working his way back from a, from a very serious knee injury, an injury that required a second cleanup surgery back in January. And I think because of that, you're sort of seeing why – we're still sort of seeing, you know, well, there's this great mystery around him. That's because we don't know how healthy that knee is for JT. And until then, we can't get a real scope of what the quarterback situation looks like, I will say. I think if there was a popularity contest this week uh, between, say, Stetson Bennett and, and the Antichrist, I think among Georgia fans, they might like the Antichrist a little bit more than <laughs> Stetson Bennett with some of the online comments that I've seen thrown his way. The reality is Stetson had a bad 20 minutes against Alabama, but he deserved to start that game, and he had earned the right to play in that Alabama game and make the mistakes that he did. And I think it, it's worth remembering here that was his third career start for Georgia. He's going to continue to get better. He's going to use this bye week to get better. 
And, and ultimately, I still, as of right now, as of this, I guess Wednesday when we're recording this, I, I still expect expect Stetson to start against the very stout Kentucky defense. Jeff, I blame Kirby Smart for the fan reaction to Stetson Bennett, and I'll tell you why. The fact that Smart makes it sound as if Daniels isn't playing because of evaluation, you know, given, I, I, you know, Mike mentioned the, the SEC teleconference on Wednesday. I haven't read all those comments yet. We're recording this on Wednesday afternoon, but I certainly watched the Tuesday press conference in its entirety. And given every chance to say that JT Daniels is still heard, Smart sidestepped every opportunity during that press conference. And so therefore it makes it sound like that Smart is simply choosing to play Stetson Bennett over a healthy JT Daniels. If that's not true, I believe that Smart should come out and say that because when he says the opposite, I think it frustrates people with with probably frustrates people with Smart, but causes them to take it out on Stetson Bennett. I think Smart's manner of speaking on this has been all wrong. Um, this is trying to keep a, a level of secrecy about something for which secrecy really has no value whatsoever. The the nasty backlash that Bennett's received this week, I think, is the fault of Smart's attempted secrecy on this. What do you think about that? Well, I guess people got to remember the. I think the perspective here really strikes me is they act like Stetson was the guy that had a Heisman campaign built around him, and he was a guy that was expected to do great things, and it was national title or bust. The way I look at this, fellas, is I look at it as Stetson was really the guy that came in and salvaged things for Georgia because otherwise you have a, a not healthy J, you have a not healthy J T Daniels not ready to go, you have a Dwan Mathis who definitely needs more game reps to get comfortable getting confused a little bit um had to be bailed out against Arkansas and then you have another true freshman in Carson Beck really I don't think Stetson Bennett should be looked at a guy that's overachieving perhaps and doing all that he possibly can reminder folks two-star three-star recruit and if anybody would have said coming out of high school that Stetson would be good enough to be one of the main engines for Georgia victories against the Tennessee and Auburn in back-to-back weeks I think most would have thought he'd already overshot over the bar of expectations about what he can be. I guess it probably honesty would make me want to say something here about Kirby Smart and quarterbacks and maybe not always playing that core. But uh, the one thing about this whole story that I, that I wonder now looking back on it, especially with the health of JT Daniels, is I thought it was very uncharacteristic, fellas, of Kirby Smart to mention a second surgery for JT Daniels during fall camp or right before the start of the season, because that's normally not a little nugget that Kirby throws out there in terms of, Hey guys, pump your brakes. The timeline might not be what you think here on JT Daniels. He actually bought JT Daniels a couple of weeks of wild quarterback speculation um, in terms of really being able to come in and take that job. Mike, I've been accused this week of being a Stetson Bennett apologist. People think I've been to, easy on him after the game against Alabama but Mike let me take you back to last year for a moment do you remember when the chatter around Jake Fromm was oh he can't ever run and he can't ever do anything that puts him at risk because Georgia has I use air quotes around this no one it can put in behind Jake Fromm that's the way that Stetson Bennett was viewed a year ago and we had no reason not to think that way Bennett had been a former walk-on and you know, he seemed like a, you know, less than fully reliable backup and yet here we are through the first portion of this season And he's played about like a sort of middle of the pack SEC quarterback, which I think is actually pretty amazing. Now that's not good enough to get Georgia to a national championship, but that's not necessarily Bennett's fault. He can only be as good as he can possibly be. I think that Georgia fans ought to be appreciative of the fact that Bennett has actually saved their bacon a little bit this year. I think if it wasn't for Bennett, they'd have more than the Alabama loss on the record right now. What would you say in response to that? Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's hard to speculate uh, how much progress Juan would have made. But to your point, I'm with you. I think the glass uh, should be half full with Stetson Bennett in terms of beating Auburn and beating Tennessee and coming in and sparking the offense and winning the confidence of his teammates. Uh, I think the chemistry has been good. I think he's picked things up quickly. I mean, the guy has been marinating for three years at Georgia and really didn't get many opportunities at all. And the fact that he was able to stay this dialed into the game plan, the fact that he's this poised, he's even got a little swagger to him. I mean, I I don't know how you could not like Stetson Bennett or appreciate what Stetson has done for Georgia. Um, You know, to your point, I I don't think they can get into a 
a scoring t- contest and, and beat Alabama. But you know what? I think there's precious few quarterbacks that could. I, I happen to think that a healthy JT Daniels is one of them. Uh, and the list wouldn't go more than four or five after that. But, you know, we don't know when JT is going to be healthy. So if it is Stetson, uh, then you play Alabama again with very little margin for error. And you need the defense to play better. You know, I don't think enough has been said not to go too off the rails here. But I don't think enough blame has been put on this defense, frankly. I mean, they were a huge letdown uh, against Alabama the way they got beat in the secondary. They're better than that. Yeah, I just don't know, Mike. I mean, we've just seen so many years worth of this, of whether it be LSU last year, Alabama 2018, where 35 points were scored, Auburn in 2017, Rose Bowl against Oklahoma. I'm just of the belief that when you face one of the best offenses in the sport, the best offense is going to win. I think that, you know, Georgia, if Georgia gives you a couple more passes broken up, finds a way to, to do what Aziz and LeCount did in the first play of the game, maybe one more time in that game, everything changes. But that, to me, is what successful defense is against top wide offense. And, Connor, I'll let you respond to this. It's not about shutting anybody down. It's about holding somebody to a number where you can make enough big plays to win. That's about all my level of expectation is for any defense against an elite offense right now, Connor. Yeah, I think part of the reason some of the backlash to Stetson this week has been so vitriolic is because Matt Jones looked incredible on on Saturday. And Matt Jones was not some mega recruit. He was, when he signed with Alabama, like Stetson Bay, he was largely an afterthought. Now, obviously, Jones had a higher sort of recruiting profile coming out. He was committed to Kentucky to play. But when I, I think Georgia fans see a guy like Matt Jones going in there and lighting it up, I I think it only raises the level of alarm when it comes to quarterback play. But I'd also point out that Jalen Waddell, Devontae Smith, Najee Harris, they were sort of making plays for Jones that made it a lot easier for him. And and I think while yes, Jermaine Burton did some nice things on Saturday, he'd also agree that he probably didn't play his best game. And I think the skill players around Georgia on that offensive side of the ball could have played a better game for Stetson or whoever the quarterback is going forward and help them out much like Alabama's playmakers did for Mac Jones. All right, I want to finish on this topic. I want to make a statement, and anybody who wants to can jump in and tell me if they agree or disagree. There, there's a way of looking at what happened in 2018, and you could maybe argue that Kirby was a little too stubborn with his quarterback situation then, should have given a little bit more room for Justin Fields. That's a legitimate argument. But some people then want to take that and extrapolate that to 2020 and say that Kirby is now being too stubborn in terms of his, you know, belief in Stetson been on the heels of the Alabama game. And I would say – that's just verifiably untrue. I mean, Stetson Bennett has not exactly been treated like the prince that was promised since coming to Georgia. He was a walk-on, then allowed to leave. Kirby has said on ESPN on Saturday, they didn't think he was ever coming back. This is not somebody that Georgia just, you know, fought and scratched and clawed to try to keep and hold on to. Um, on the CBS broadcast, I forget if it was the Auburn game, the Tennessee game, but on the CBS broadcast, it was basically reported there that they told Bennett that he'd never be a starting quarterback in Georgia. This is not someone who's, you know, got a Jake Fromm level of connection with, with, with Kirby Smart. The, uh, the idea that somehow Smart is only going to stick with Bennett now because of either a stubbornness or a sense of loyalty, the way that Bennett has been treated at Georgia in the past, Jeff, I, I think is all the evidence you need. No, that's not exactly true. Yeah, I mean, like, like here's, a good, here's a good thought here. Imagine uh, a guy like Carson Beck. Carson Beck having to wait his turn behind two quarterbacks at Georgia. Maybe that's the prince who was promised part one. I'll use Brandon's phrasing there. And then the prince who was promised part two. And let's say he doesn't play until 2023. By that time, he has four years of banked reps in the offense and in the system. Uh, And let's be clear, Mac Jones was a three-star recruit, number 400 overall in the country. Uh, Even Carson was a number 10 overall quarterback, about 200 overall in the country. Higher prospect profile. But when you hang around that long and you go against a a top-of-the-flight defense like that, you're going to get better. And then when you've got the pieces that Mac Jones has, man, he's got the offensive line. I don't think we say enough about the offensive line. I don't think we say enough about those receivers. I think Kirby said in his press conference on Tuesday that, hey, I thought we played pretty good. There were just a lot of 50-50 balls where – their guy was just better than our guy. And we usually get more of those. And what does that mean? That means Georgia had low first round, second round corners, potentially covering top 20, top 15 wide receivers in Alabama. 
Alabama should win those matchups, and that's just what it is. I think Georgia's got to get very careful here and not falling into that program that's number three, number four in the country. But there's always some program that's the all-time this or the all-time that that's always going to be a little bit better. I do think that falls on the quarterback position. I do think that falls on the wide receiver room as well. Uh, but then you hear Jeremy, speaking of platitudes, Brandon, you hear Jeremy Pruitt say today before we tape this show that he considered the offense to be the greatest offensive unit he's ever seen. Makes me wonder if he even saw in the LSU game tape a year ago. But also that platitude goes a long way when you sit there and go what Alabama has to offer. I think it's not just the quarterback here at Georgia. I think it's Don Blaylock. I think it's George Pickens getting better or not stuck in neutral his second year. Then that's Jermaine Burton getting on the number three cornerback in the in a defensive scheme. I think that's a lot of that, along with the quarterback having to get better. Simply put, Georgia just doesn't have that high-powered offense to get to 30, 35 points to win a shootout with Alabama, even with some good defensive stops. And, Mike, isn't that just the thing that has just been – what What are you talking about, hey, should it be Stetson Bennett or somebody else? Are you talking about last year, what's wrong with Jake Fromm? Or really any conversation you want to have. The reason Georgia hasn't yet won a national championship – is about that explosive offense. Something that does keep pace with LSU of last year, Alabama of this year, or Clemson of this year, Clemson of 2018, or, you know, even to a degree, Ohio State there a little bit. That whatever moving pieces you have on the chessboard, it's still about the fact that Georgia has not yet found that truly explosive offense. They run the ball very well. They play good defense. They're good on both lines of scrimmage. And if you want to beat up on lesser opponents in the SEC, that's the exact formula to do that. We'll get into more in the show later on about exactly what George is about to do in that regard. But, but we've been talking now for a number of years about being as explosive as the offense is the very best team in the country. And from that standpoint, what we're doing here in 2020 really isn't all that different, right? Well, I, again, I, I think with Stetson, you're a little bit more limited in how aggressive you call the games. I, I think Kirby said he doesn't want to get into these scoring contests. I, I thought maybe in 2017 you took your foot off the gas against Alabama a little bit in a game you should have won. And I would even say the same thing about the, the Alabama game of 2018. I don't want to – I mean, Jim Chaney's gone now, but part of that's Kirby. Um, I, I think Kirby would have a different mentality now. I think he's into – when he gets the chance, I think he's going to score more points. I think you're going to see him put the accelerator down a little bit more and be more aggressive with the play calls. But right now with this quarterback uh, and this young receiver group that, as you mentioned, has huge potential, they're still growing and finding themselves. Um, I do think, though, that Kirby has changed it. He wouldn't have hired Todd Munkin if he hadn't changed his mentality. So that, that to me, is the good sign that, that Kirby recognizes that, as you said, B.A., that you've got to score a lot of points. But let me just uh, finish with this, and I promise we're going to move on. You know, speaking as a fan here for a moment, I'd love nothing more than to think that uh, there's this quarterback waiting in the wings that's about to kind of explode in the scene. But all I can go on is what's being said right now, Mike. And based on what's being said, you know, the notion that JT Daniels is going to swoop in and save the season for Georgia, I really have no evidence to go on that that's going to happen. Reading between the lines with what you've said on Dog Nation Daily, what you're saying right now, is you seem to think that, hey, once JT Downs in, the, in there, everything is going to be fixed. But, but, but why would I even believe that Daniels is about to play, just given the fact that he has just, to this point in time, seemed so far away from playing for whatever the reason is? Yeah, I mean, the only evidence that I can, you know, really tell you that it's visible is, you know, he, he took his knee brace off before the Tennessee game, you know, during the warm-ups. He, he, that, to me, is the sign that, that he believes he's ready to play. And for the people that want to see more, they just need to put in the 2018 U S army all American game and look at how he played and, you know, and how Trevor Lawrence played, watch him beat Tyson Campbell uh, with his throws. Um, you know, look at some of the modern day stuff when he won a national championship, took down the best programs in the country. Look at what he did when he did have pass protection at USC. And even though there were three different play cars in one season, I mean, you know, there's a reason why this guy was the third highest rated quarterback in that 2018 class behind Lawrence and Fields. And there's and there's video evidence of it out there. As for Georgia, I saw 30 minutes and I saw a guy that got through his progressions as quickly as Jake Fromm that threw it with with more authority and and with more velocity than Jake uh, doesn't have the mobility of Stetson, uh, but does have pocket sense. That's what I saw in 30 minutes. Um, but that's a small sample size. And so I can understand why you might have some questions, particularly 
you know, since he hasn't been on the field yet, and we don't know where he's at injury-wise because Kirby, quite frankly, doesn't divulge much at all. And as you said, he keeps it a mystery. Cover four live presented by Georgia Farm Bureau. Let me change the subject here, and Connor, I want to bring you in on this. So Georgia fails its first big test the season, losing at Alabama, which brings to mind the next big test and arguably the biggest of the season because it's the one game that allows you to punch your ticket for the SEC championship coming up against Florida. Do you think Georgia fans should be more worried about beating Florida now that they've seen their team not get it done against Alabama or maybe said a different way is what Alabama exposed also potentially a vulnerability against the Gators as well? I don't think so because I think the biggest difference between what Florida has and what Alabama has is Alabama has two of those guys that are first round difference makers that are guys that are just faster, better athletes than what Georgia can match up with in the secondary. I don't necessarily know if that is true with Kyle Pitts. I think even he had a very good game first half against Georgia last year. And then in the second half of that Florida game, Georgia sort of just erased him from the game. And, and I know a lot of people like what Kyle Trask has done so far this season, but I don't know how a quarterback plays better than what Mac Jones did on Saturday. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if there's, if he can make up that much more ground. And then to bring it back to recruiting, Alabama is just a better, more athletic team than what Florida has, whereas I think Georgia has a distinct advantage when it comes to Florida over that. And sort of close it here on why I'm, I'm not quite as worried about Florida as I was and we all were about Alabama is Florida's not practicing right now. They're not doing anything right now. Dan Mullen, I believe, came out today and said he hopes to get back on the field on Monday. They haven't played these last two weeks, but they haven't practiced either. They haven't been able to really work on anything offensively or work on fixing that defense because they've been so impacted by COVID. I think the latest reports that I had read were 31 31- players that I'm guessing scholarship and walk-on have been impacted by COVID. So those guys, you wonder what sort of shape they're going to be in if they're not even able to go in and work out. So I, I think when you factor in the talent gap that still exists along with the COVID concerns, this Florida game isn't any more concerning to me than it was before and now after the Alabama game. Yeah, Mike, I'll, I'll tell you that I am not the least bit worried about Florida for Georgia right now. The Alabama game doesn't open a lot of that up for me. I think Alabama is a different kind of opponent. I've said this on Dog Nation Daily this week. When you face the most NFL-style teams in college football, the throw game is just going to matter because the passing game is a huge part of what's happening in the NFL. But Georgia-Florida is still a college football game. That's a game in which lines of scrimmage, Georgia has the advantage on both sides of the ball. I think that matters. The Florida defense is not very good. Florida doesn't run the ball the way that Georgia does. Let's not forget, you know, you're, you're thinking about the Alabama passing game, but Nashi Harris is still a weapon. That kind of weapon really just doesn't exist with Florida right now. I think that Georgia, for the most part, can lean on what it already does well, and I expect it to still beat Florida. Frankly, I think that Stetson Bennett as your starting quarterback against Florida is no problem at all. Uh, that's a game in which I would still expect Georgia to win, regardless of, of what's going on with the quarterback spot there at that point in time. You think that's too optimistic of an assessment? No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's a game of matchups, and I like the way Georgia matches up with Florida. As I said, I'm, I'm a little more worried about going up there to Kentucky if I'm Georgia right now. I mean, you're coming off a loss. You're a little shaken. Your confidence is probably that not quite what it was. Uh, We don't know the quarterback situation. We know Kirby doesn't want to be thrown at 40 times a game. You get into a smash mouth game against Kentucky. You've beat them 10 years in a row. Uh, They've got some momentum right now. They're due to beat Georgia in their minds. We've seen crazy things happen in the SEC. We know that they're very good at the line of scrimmage. We saw Georgia's defensive front. uh, I don't want to say exposed, but we saw them get beat. I don't think anybody would deny that Alabama kicked their butts on the front line. And Kentucky is supposed to have the number two offensive line in the league. So uh, if Kentucky can run the ball effectively and Georgia has more turnovers um, throwing the football, that that's a game. That's a game that I have circled. Uh, I, you know, Georgia knows how to show up and beat Florida. Uh, they've done it. The players know it. I think there's a confidence there uh, when they get on that airplane for that home game in Jacksonville. I think they know they can fly down there to Florida and beat the Gators 70 miles from Gainesville or on Mars if they needed to. But Kentucky is a game that could be overlooked, and Kentucky is a team that has some momentum. So I would actually be more concerned as a Georgia fan about what, about the game at Kentucky than Florida right now. I want to come back to that and the remainder of the Georgia schedule beyond this. But, Jeff, give me a thought on Georgia-Florida. You see reasons for concern in that game? Uh, zero reasons. I think, uh, simply put, I can state that 
Georgia's inability to rise to Alabama's level is not an indictment on saying that they're going to regress to the rest of the SEC East. I think the point's have been made a couple of times. One, I think Florida can give you what Mac Jones will give you and, and with one of those receivers in terms of Kyle Pitts. Florida does not have a Najee Harris. Florida does not have a great offensive line, which is what Alabama has with looks like now three early day one, day two picks across that front. Um, Georgia, not good enough to beat Alabama, but that doesn't mean it's not good enough to still take care of business with the rest of its schedule in the SEC East. And Connor, obviously, if we end up being right about this, and I mean, you just heard a fairly clean sweep across the board of not Georgia still handles Florida, then what do you sell if you're damn well at that point in time? You've got the experience of quarterback. You're supposed to have the most dynamic playmaking weapon, Kyle Pitts, who I do think is dangerous in this game. Georgia had a hard time with the tight end last year when Cole Komet and Notre Dame. And obviously, this is you know, music to my ears because I don't like them all. And I don't like the Gators. I have fun with all that. In fact, I got uh, Eddie for you right here. I'm in the Dog Nation uh, studio here today. <laughs> so I got all that going for you. But in all seriousness, I've said this before that that I think this is the highest stakes Georgia-Florida game of really quite some time because narratives, one of the two narratives is going to be destroyed. Either the narrative that as long as Georgia has better players, it's bulletproof against Florida. If Florida loses, wins this game, you know, in a couple of weeks, becomes a little harder to sell that. In fact, it becomes almost impossible to sell that. George is at least vulnerable in that game to Dan Mullen's coaching ability. You have to acknowledge that because they have a far weaker roster. However, if Georgia, with its former walk-on quarterback, guy who started the year at fourth string, uh, were to win that game again, and obviously offense would be a part of that, then how does Dan Mullen ever convince anyone it's going to be better than it is in 2020 without crying COVID? I mean, that, that's what they're going to do. They're going to circle and cite COVID as a reason that they weren't able to get up and win that game and play in the manner in which they potentially could. But, you know, ultimately, I, I think it, 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 as much as you don't like Dan Mullen, B.A., you probably want Dan Mullen to still stay around the Florida program because he's seemingly good enough to keep Florida relevant, make that a top 10, 15 game every year. But he's not great enough to sort of beat Georgia and really threaten them in a manner that they should be. So I think that's exactly right. And I think it's an interesting look at the Florida game coming up on a couple Saturdays from now, a few Saturdays from now. Uh, with that in mind here on Cover 4 Live, presented by Georgia Farm Bureau, let's shift gears now to our fourth topic and the remainder of the Georgia schedule beyond that. Mike Griffith just made an articulate case a moment ago for why Kentucky is a game he's concerned about. Mike, I will tell you that I talked to Connor and others about this off the air a lot last week that going into the Alabama game, the Kentucky game was one that I was concerned about. However, once the off week was changed and moved to this upcoming Saturday, my concern about Kentucky kind of went away there at that point in time. I think a lot of people aren't quite aware of the fact that had the schedule remained the way that it was supposed to be based on what came out this summer, Georgia would be playing its fifth consecutive SEC game this week. That's something that Georgia had only done once in the Kirby Smart era. Was back in 2016, dogs only went two and three over that stretch. It wasn't a very good Georgia team, so that's easy to understand. But the fifth of those games was the, I think it was 17-16, 17-16 loss to Vanderbilt, a game in which Georgia was clearly fatigued from where it had been a little earlier there in that stretch. I think the five straight is just kind of a, a tough deal. Georgia will play that later on, but in this case, I think later is better. Georgia avoids the post-Alabama hangover, which has been an issue for some SEC teams in the past. They avoid, for now, the fifth consecutive Saturday against SEC opponents. I think that Georgia actually handles Kentucky coming up in a couple of weeks. That's not the game that I'm worried about. Uh, but, Jeff, is there a non-Florida game on the remainder of the schedule that you'd be paying close attention to? Mike made his case for uh, Kentucky there a moment ago. I guess to answer your question, I wonder if Georgia on the road at Missouri, Georgia perhaps with South Carolina, somehow, some way, Georgia always plays seven to 17 points below their threshold whenever they face the Gamecocks. Uh, those are games that I'm not going to really raise a yellow caution light up about, but those are the ones that kind of simmer up to me. I don't think Mississippi State is a game. I don't think – I don't think uh, Vanderbilt is a game per se. You know, those are the games, those other two SEC East games. We talk about A, they're on the road, changes in routine. B, it's going to be in the back half of the season where more, more injuries, more depletion of your depth can possibly happen. Uh, you know, those are the type of things that worry me. 
who knows, man, maybe, maybe that JT Daniels knee gets right. Or uh, there's another key injury Georgia has to overcome on its offense or offensive front offensive personnel as well. I think those are the things, just the attrition of the season. We don't know this, Brandon, you were citing out some stats earlier. We don't know what it's going to be like for a, for an SEC team, SEC team come game seven, game eight, game nine, having played nothing but SEC teams in the schedule. And Georgia will also only have one off week in the middle of all that. Connor, Jeff mentions Missouri. I think Missouri's a real threat to beat Kentucky this week, actually. One thing we know about them, that's not a good team. But they can throw the ball around a little bit. Yeah, I, I think to answer your – go back to your original question there, I do kind of agree with Mike. This Kentucky game is going to be tricky. They run the ball very well, and they have a very good pass defense, nine interceptions in their past two games. But I think getting them after a bye, it does make it a less tricky game. I'd be much more worried if they were actually playing in this week as they were scheduled to do so. And then I'll say the South Carolina game, they've got a very interesting game against LSU this week. They've won two straight games. Granted, One of them was against a compromised Vanderbilt team, and then one of them was against Auburn last week. You call them compromised? And then they go in and they win at LSU this weekend. I know LSU isn't what it is in the past, but that seems like a team that they have a little confidence in them. They can start getting on a roll. And, you know, I'm not going to say that we're going to win seven, eight games, but they might be a a friskier, tougher out given what they have. I think Will Muschamp is an actual good defensive football coach. I think Mike Bobo is a very good offensive coach as well. They might be able to make that game a little bit more difficult than perhaps the talent edge suggests that it should be. So South Carolina is my answer there as well to once again ring the same bell from a moment ago. That will be Georgia's fifth consecutive game. I do think that matters. Now, it matters less late in the season than it would against Kentucky right now because Gamecocks will also be fatigued and they're, you know, just a less talented team than Georgia. But pretty quietly, and Connor touched on the run that South Carolina has been on as of late, to blow out Vanderbilt on the road when they were only a two-touchdown favorite is at least something. To handle Auburn last week is at least something. The LSU game, I think, could be a tricky spot for South Carolina. But if it wasn't for all the, oh, my gosh, Arkansas is way better than we expected, I think South Carolina might actually be getting some of that love right now. I think of the non-Florida games that Georgia will play the rest of the season, I think South Carolina is the most dangerous. The other thing to remember here is when Mike, when the SEC and the ACC weren't able to come to an agreement on having those non-conference rivalry games played, I think the South Carolina Clemson folks were the most upset about that because that rivalry just means more in that state than probably Georgia, Georgia Tech does, things like that. And so I think the SEC threw South Carolina a little bit of a bone to allow them to host what they view as the rivalry game on the weekend in which they might normally be playing Clemson. So to the extent that you can create an atmosphere in kind of a COVID environment, I think williams Bryce Stadium could be decently loud. And, and, you know, as I said before, as much social as social distancing will allow, that could be a, a decent home field atmosphere, just given the fact that's kind of viewed as South Carolina's replacement for the Clemson game this year. Yeah, you know, South Carolina treats Georgia as their second biggest rival behind Clemson, too. I mean, I remember Debo Samuel saying that, that Georgia was their biggest rival, that Georgia was the tougher, more physical team than Clemson. So this is always a big game for South Carolina. And to your point, B.A., if they're having success, uh, they're going to be tough, you know, as opposed to cashing it in. And, you know, are they playing to keep their – fighting to keep their head coach's job? I mean, most champ came into this season on the hot seat. I thought he needed to beat Auburn. I thought that was a really big win for, for Will Muschamp's career. I think, they, I think they need to beat LSU. I don't think this is a very good LSU team. The biggest surprise to me is Pittman. Second biggest surprise is how bad LSU is. So – I think a lot of it has to do with where those programs are at. Uh, Certainly, you know, we assume Georgia is going to beat Florida, but if somehow, shape or form, Georgia should stumble and lose to Florida, I think South Carolina becomes even more dangerous. Uh, You mentioned this. I'll ask you real quick. Uh, I don't think Will Muschamp's going to lose his job now. I think he's going to win enough to save it. Now, that's a lot of football left, but do you agree with me on that? Don't know. You know, don't know how the chips are going to fall. You know, we've seen how quickly things can change in this league. Uh, I do think beating Auburn was a really big game for him. And, and now I think Gus Malzahn shifts to the hot seat a little bit. And I've heard some people throw the theory out there, B.A., that because it's a COVID-19 year, because these budgets are being stretched out, that, that schools wouldn't pay the 15 or the $20 million that it would take uh, to buy out Muschamp or, or Malzahn respectfully. Uh, you know, and I, and I don't know what to make about it. You know, some of these folks in castles push millions of dollars around without a second thought. Uh, they're certainly passionate. 
I, I don't underestimate anything SEC related when it comes to booster activity or coaches being fired too quickly. Uh, Connor and Jeff, I'll let you weigh in on this. There is a lot of chatter coming out of Auburn. It seems to be affecting the 2021 class. You've seen the rumors about Smile Mondin and others. Do you think Gus Malzahn survives the 2020 season on the basis of where things stand right now? And I think that there's obviously a lot more football for him to play too. Connor, you can go first. I think there are 21 million reasons why Gus Malzahn will still be employed there because that is his buyout as of December 1st. But as Mike pointed out, stranger things have happened. And the thing with Auburn now is, you know, for so long, Gus was touted as this offensive guru, this guy who, who's a great offensive mind. And the reality is that this Auburn program just hasn't been that. I think a lot of teams have figured out how to play with and against tempo and Gus has really struggled to adjust to that. I think Bo Nix struggling. He was a five-star quarterback, admittedly, not in the same five-star caliber as Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, or even JT Daniels for that matter. But him continuing to not progress as a quarterback there, I think it only really looks worse and worse for Malzahn. And Auburn almost always has more odd year success because of the way their schedule sets up. But if things don't get better this year, 2021 could be – a very, very big and very important year for Malzahn down there on the Plains. Jeff, what do you think real quick? Yeah, I think this environment, I think Mike touched on it. When you've got employees being furloughed, furloughed and then you're buying out a coach to the tune of some $20, 25000000 million, I don't think that's a good look, especially in this year. I don't know where the funds are going to keep coming from. It's not like Auburn has Yellowwood or you know anybody else, Great Southern Wood. Uh, pressure treated pine type money anymore to pay these things out. The days of a Bobby Louder are kind of over. I would like, I would look at one thing though. He's already done everything he can. He's already swapped coordinators. Does, does Chad Morris get another, get another axe as, as, as he buys more time with a change coordinator? It just seems like now looking at Auburn and they're light years away from where Georgia's at. Auburn and Gus seem to be going back to their run game, tight end, hand in the ground, block guy roots rather than opening up the offense with all their playmakers. Should I, be a bit, go ahead, one, one, one last quick thing. Uh, this is just reckless speculation out there, but there was a coach with ties to the SEC that has a proven track record against Saban that is turning around a program right now that is, I believe, only in its second year at the FBS and doing some very impressive things. With, with a quarterback a that former, Auburn – yeah. A former Auburn quarterback, Malik Willis, that would be one Hugh Freeze. I think if and when – Auburn decides to move on from Gus Malzahn, Hugh Freeze would theoretically be a very attractive candidate to that opening. Mike, I think Hugh Freeze is hireable again. Hugh Freeze was not hireable a couple of years ago, even as an offensive coordinator. Hey, Saban got his hand slapped for even trying. Um, I, I don't think that's true anymore. If an SEC team wanted to hire Hugh Freeze for 2021, I believe they'd get the green light to do so. I still think Dan Lanning is going to be at the top of some lists as well, even though that was a bad performance against Alabama. I think he's a recruiter. Uh, I think he's a guy, a, a program maker. And I would be surprised if Dan Lanning wasn't a head coach in the SEC within the next two years. All right, we're going to leave it there for today. Mario Crystal Ball. Watch Mario Crystal Ball. That's a name to think about right there, especially coming back to the SEC West. You want to talk about buyout money and who would do that? Mario and what he's doing at, at Oregon is definitely making a lot of waves. So we're not live today, so no cover more with your questions and comments. We'll be back Thursday, a week from now, at our regular time and give you a chance to do that. Huge thanks to our friends at Georgia Farm Bureau for making all of this possible. Check them out and uh, follow their I Farm I Vote campaign, ifarmivotega.com. Plenty more information on that. We apologize for the absence of comments today, but we'll look forward to catching up with you on a lot of platforms over the course of the next few days. And then back here again, live next Thursday, 730, for Cover 4 Live presented by Georgia Farm Bureau. Getting ready for the Kentucky Wildcats then. We'll talk to you soon, everybody.